Coming up, they spent roughly a million dollars making an album that should have been the biggest of its time. However, after the better part of a year, this band threw it all away. They completely scrapped the entire record. No one in the band liked to finish tracks, which they dubbed the million dollar demos. Even worse, all four band members were at each other's throats at this point. Infighting was on the verge of fist fighting. Three albums into their career, they were done. So it seemed with their frontman touring with another band, but somehow uh, they found their mojo and recorded 14 new songs in a matter of days, including today's iconic Never Say Die hit single. This song turned everything around for this band as they stared down the crossroads. It's a story of near disaster and unexpected miracles, and how the song has a whole new meaning right now. Stories coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you remember staying up late to catch Friday night videos in the good old 80s, you're gonna dig this channel a pure musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now, click the big red button, click the bell so you always know when our latest and greatest are coming out. Got a lot of great interviews coming. Also check us out on Patreon, that helps us keep it a daily channel. And uh, also, check out our merch below, Three Chords and the Truth. So it's time for another edition of our show, number one in our hearts. It's actually the first one we've done in this decade that we're going to talk about. So, of course, is the show that honors songs that were so undeniably great. They should have been number one on the Billboard Hot 100. Uh, but for whatever reason, be a radio play, you know, lack of marketing, changing musical taste, or just sheer stupidity, the song came up short. Previous episodes, we've covered Buddy Holly by Weezer. The Zombie by the Cranberries. And my friends by uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. So today's song, uh, it's chart position. I'm going to chalk that one up to sheer stupidity. Let's just say it didn't even come close to number one. But that's not on the band. Rather, it was just the state of popular music at the time. Even so, this song is a number one no-brainer. Since its inception, the song has inspired listeners to fight through adversity and instilled hope in all who hear it. It's one for one of the biggest rock bands that's still going strong. It's Times Like These by Foo Fighters. It sounds like an easier so after coming home from touring their third album, There's Nothing Left to Lose, in early 2001, Foo Fighters were already looking ahead to their next record. Uh, for reference, at this time, Foo Fighters consisted of multi-instrumentalist frontman Dave Grohl, bassist Nate Mendel, drummer Taylor Hawkins, and newcomer guitarist Chris Shiflett. As the year progressed, the band made some headway on their fourth album. They are writing new music and recording demos. However, by late summer, the Foos hit the skids when a catastrophic blow almost took out Taylor Hawkins. After playing the V Festival in the UK, uh, the legendary drummer was hospitalized after an alleged uh, heroin overdose. Taylor went comatose for two days, said Hawkins about it at the time, partying in London one night and I mistakenly did something and it changed everything. I just got out of control for a while and it almost got me. After coming to, Hawkins hit rehab to get clean. But with Taylor MIA, the Foo Fighters were forced to, to the sidelines, essentially. To keep busy, Dave Grohl accepted an invitation to play drums for Queens of the Stone Age uh, on their debut album, Songs for the Deaf. Remember that? It was an experience that he thoroughly enjoyed. By December, though, a renewed Hawkins returned to work with the band at Grohl's Studio 606 in Virginia. The songs, uh, Dave would later confirm, were a heavier response to the lighter nature of There's Nothing Left to Lose, which, according to Grohl, was written lying on the bed in front of the television uh, with an acoustic guitar, just strumming along. In January 2002, Grohl wrote in the band's studio diary, we finished six songs and are going out to LA to do the rest. Need a change of scenery. We have about three weeks left and then we're done. Done. Everything has turned out killer so far. This new album was going to turn it up to 11. I mean, girl even joked, we have guitar leads on our songs now. <laughs> However, when those three weeks stretch into three months, 
Uh, Dave altered his assessment. The band had 10 finished tracks that no one in the band liked at all. Taylor Hawkins called it like he saw it. Nobody had their studio chops together. The album sounded like it was phoned in. According to Dave, it felt like they were making an album just for the sake of making an album. No one was dying to do it. It just felt really forced. Now, of those 10 tracks, Dave admitted to somewhat liking five of them, about half of them, but no one was fired up about anything on the record. Even worse, they had spent a million plus dollars to make this thing. I mean, that's a hefty price tag for an album that nobody wanted. Afterwards, they dubbed the Fell Venture the Million Dollar Demos. It was a complete fiasco. Four months, a million bucks, and nothing to show for it. It just felt completely uninspired. So they just threw it away. As you can imagine, tensions were running high in this band. There was a lot of animosity. There was a lot of arguing. Nate Mendel admitted that he had a bad attitude due to disagreements with Grohl. And Schifflet said he spent whole days in the studio without playing anything. He was convinced that the band was breaking up. So in April 2002, Dave Grohl called the whole thing, called it off. It was time to step back and reevaluate Foo Fighters. At this moment, the band was dangerously close to calling it quits altogether. So while the Foo Fighters were mulling things over, Dave was getting jacked up for a new project, a new band. A month earlier in March 2002, Grohl had manned the drum kit at a Queens of the Stone Age concert in L.A., uh, it was supposed to be a one-off gig. Believe it or not, though, this was the first time David played the drums on stage for the better part of a decade at that point. Actually, the first time since Nirvana. Now, Dave Grohl admitted he really felt the pressure, but he loved it. He loved it so much he agreed to tour full-time with the Queens. He said playing for Queens of the Stone Age was more inspiring and productive than working on the Foo's latest album at that point. It's the best thing I could have done. Uh, he said, back home, there was tension between Taylor and I, between Nate and I. This gave us all a rest. Getting behind the drums again it was an obvious escape, end of quote. It was an escape that Dave may not have returned from, if not for one last do-or-die performance with the Foos. So Queens of the Stone Age were slotted to play the two-day Coachella Music and Arts Festival on April 27th, 2002. So Dave booked Foo Fighters for April 28th. Though the initial returns weren't promising, in rehearsals, attentions, they were fired up between Grohl and Hawkins. It was kind of shaping up to be the Foo Fighters' final performance at that point. <laughs> that is until it wasn't, said Chris Shifflett about it. We all got in a huge argument. It was maybe the closest the band actually ever really did come to breaking up. But then it didn't. The night of the show, the estranged band rediscovered uh, their passion for playing together as, as a band. They found the energy they'd been sorely missing for so long. They thought, okay, maybe this could work. Maybe this isn't the end. Grohl kept his commitment to tour at the Queens of the Stone Age, but Grohl also had a two-week break coming up. So he actually reached out to Taylor Hawkins, and the feuding friends decided to write some songs together. Said Grohl about it. I went out with Queens of the Stone Age, and I had this two-week period that was like downtime. So I called Taylor and said, hey, why don't you and I go down to Virginia and record? I have a couple of new ideas. So in this burst of creative energy, the two of them wrote and recorded 14 songs. It's just a matter of days. Together, they cut all the drum, vocal, and guitar tracks. It all just flowed. Just two friends messing around, having fun again. Grohl called up Chris and Nate, and he said, hey, I think we just re-recorded the whole record here. They're like, what? <laughs> yeah, we did three songs yesterday, doing two today, we're doing three songs tomorrow. It was coming together. Now, while Dave hit the road with the Queens of the Stone Age, Chris and Nate finished their parts in LA under the supervision of accidental producer Nick Graskulinitz. More on Nick in just a second. Now, as we continue to break down this song, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny. I wear the glasses I always wear. You know, right now, if you click the info button right up here, you can go to the Zenny website and create your own pair of frames. You choose the color, the shape, the style, everything. And, you know, you can add amazing features. And you can get these frames at the most competitive price point around. Uh, up to 80% off regular retail prices. Click on our special link to get that. This was an amazing time for the band because the Foos, at this point, seemed like they had some fight left in them. Uh, according to Grohl, everyone was uncertain whether he would come back. 
but knew he was. Even though he was having a blast every night playing drums with the Queens, he had to come back. His Foo Fighting bandmates, they were his family. Said girl about it, this is where my heart has always been. After uh, all the pitfalls and devours, the Foo Fighters were back. They called the new album One by One. It hit store shelves on October 22nd, 2002. Better late than never. The LP went to number one in the UK on its first week of release, climbed to number three here in the States. It was also a hit around the world that went to the top 10 in at least 11 countries. Now, One by One boasted four singles. There was All My Life, All my life I've been searching for something, something never comes, never leads to nothing. Low, Low as you go, as low as you go. Have It All, <laughs> and of course, Times Like These. Man, Times Like These. It's such a cathartic track. Um, it perfectly captures, you know, the drama and the relief the Foo Fighters experience in real time making this album. You can hear it in the song, the, the fire, the passion, the heart, it is all there. I'm a one -way motorway. Times like these, it's everything the Foo Fighters were missing the first time they recorded their album. Uh, the, the album previous. But this song represents even more than the band you know, just returning to form. It's Foo Fighters elevating their sonic brilliance to an even higher level. You know, setting a new standard of excellence. This song and this band are so authentic. You can see that in how they made One by One. It was passion or nothing. No compromise. They were ready to break up the band if they couldn't record songs that they truly believed in. Before I dig in any deeper on this song, let me just give you the story about uh, accidental producer Nick Raskulenitz, since it does relate to the song. So Nick was recruited by Grohl to produce times like these before uh, he got the go-ahead on the rest of the album. I guess called an audition, but he, he nailed it. Uh, the crazy thing is, it all happened by chance. Actually, Dave Grohl, he meant to recruit a completely different Nick for the song. That Nick was Nick Oliveri, the bassist from Queens of the Stone Age. But while he was going through his contacts, he dialed the wrong Nick. Rowski Lennitz had already worked with Foo Fighters as an engineer on the Godzilla track A320, which is why Dave had Nick's number in the first place. place but rather than you know, fess up and admit that he'd called the wrong Nick, Dave instead invited him to produce times like these. Whether accident or fate, it was Nick's big break, and he did make the most of it. Since then, he's gone on to produce more big names uh, as Rush, Alice in Chains, and Hellstorm, just to name a few. Plus, the next Foo Fighter album, uh, 2005's In Your Honor, did that one as well. But back to times like these. Not only does this song uh, capture the turmoil leading up to one by one, but it also delivers a powerful, universal message that we can all relate to. I mean, we've all been through times where we've had to learn to live again, learn to love again, not to get all cheesy, but just like Dave, we know what it's like to feel a little divided, to wonder you know, whether to stay or run away. Run away leave it all I mean, Dave summarized the essence of the song perfectly when he said, I wrote this song times like these at a point in my life where I was at a crossroads, where I had to make a change and a decision. But I was hopeful. And so the song is all about learning to live again, learning to love again, because it's meant to represent a continuation of life. Life, you know, whether we like it or not, it keeps moving on. But hopefully we keep moving too, even when there's pain and adversity. Times like these, it, it uh, encourages you to, to keep pushing, despite the opposition. It's times like these you learn to at times like these, it just, uh, it's an encourager. It just pushes you despite the opposition. I love Dave's subtle contrast between light and darkness in verse two, where he sings, uh, I'm a new day rising. I, I'm a new day rising. Little tip of the hat to Husker do there. I, I'm a new day rising. I'm a brand new sky to hang the stars upon tonight. Stars upon tonight. 
this brilliant jukebox poetry, my friends. I mean, so hopeful, so resonant. Still, it's that chorus that drives it all home. It's times like these you learn to live again. We learn to live, we learn to give, we learn to love. It's times like these you learn to love again. We learn to never give up, even when the world is at its worst. Times Like These was released as the second single off One by One, uh, January 6, 2003 to be direct. Shockingly, it only reached number 65 on the Hot 100. Uh, musical tastes were changing. I mean, look at what was dominating the Hot 100 at the time. The top three spots at that moment. Number three, Get Busy by Sean Paul. Number two, Ignition by R. Kelly. Get in the, the ignition, so give me that. Let me give you that. And at number one, The Club by 50 Cent. Kind of makes me shudder. At times like these, it's one of the greatest songs ever written. It's also a breath of fresh air then and now. You know, I try to stay positive on this channel, I do, but it breaks my heart what has happened to mainstream music in the new millennium. Uh, emphasis on mainstream here. I know there's good music out there, but most of it's just been pushed underground. We need another Nirvana. We need another moment that shakes it up. Anyway, the good news is that times like these did go to number five on uh, the alternative airplay chart, and it went to number five on the US mainstream rock chart. Uh, elsewhere, it reached number 27 in Ireland, number 22 in Australia, number 12 in the UK, and number one on the UK rock and metal chart. Uh, interestingly, uh, times like these has three official music videos, a rare feat indeed. But no complaints here. Two are for the studio version of the song and a third for an acoustic take. Uh, that acoustic version was recorded on November 29, 2002 uh, at the BBC Radio 1 studio. Like these, learn to live again. It was then released on Radio 1's Live Lounge Volume 2 compilation. Either way, it's definitely worth a listen. Times Like These has appeared in a handful of movies and TV shows since its release. Uh, that lineup includes American Wedding, Criminal Minds, Jericho, and One Tree Hill, to name a few. Times like these, ah! It's also been covered by Florence and the Machine. And a Shine Down. Like Kelly Clarkson. And the script. Also in 2019, Brandy Carlisle partnered with Dave Grohl for a surprise busking session at Seattle's iconic Pike Place Market. I, I'm a one -way motorway. Along with the Flying Fish, times like these uh, was on the menu that day. Other notable performances include Saturday Night Live, David Letterman, and the Howard Stern Show. Really can't get enough of this song. What is this song? It's off the new record. I, I'm a one way motorway. But you know as well as I do, the ultimate performance of times like these, uh, this song happened at the Taylor Hawkins Tribute Concert, uh, September 3rd, 2022 at London's Wembley Stadium. Doesn't get any more powerful or emotional than this. I, I'm a I mean, come on. You know I can't get through a Foo Fighters episode without paying tribute to Taylor Hawkins. Man, he's so missed. His passing still feels so raw. It feels like it happened yesterday. It's just hard to believe. So personally, this song came to me at the perfect time in my life, um, I was going through a heart-wrenching divorce. I was as low as I'd ever been. And this song was a life preserver. It made me step up and keep going. It motivated me to come back even stronger, to persevere, to survive. This song just has that ability, the ability to make you feel like you're 20 feet tall and invincible, like you get through anything. Times like these doubles as a four and a half minute therapy session. You still feel the loss, but for a brief moment, you know you can bear the pain and make it through. It's times like these, you give, you give, you give. Okay, so as we fade out here, let me give Dave the last word on his best friend, Taylor. 
Not long after the release of One by One, after they had come back from the brink of breaking up, he had nothing but praise for his friend. He said, Taylor and I, we have a connection that I've never felt with another person in a band. I know that Taylor will be in my life for the rest of my life. And so for the two of us to connect in the studio like we did was just really great. Taylor needs to be recognized as one of the best drummers you've ever seen in your life. I mean, I would have nothing less in my life, especially as a drummer. End of quote. Now, piggybacking off of that, you know, recently I caught Foo Fighters in concert, a little closer to home here. It was a revelation. <laughs> I mean, when you see these guys live, you, you know what I mean. It was one of their first concerts back with their new drummer. And as Dave got to this song in the set, he played the slowed down version and went in full throttle. But uh, I was in the front row against the rail, about eight feet from Dave. And he gave one of the most emotional performances of this song I've ever witnessed. I filmed it. I'll give you a little bit here. Learn to love again. Like you could sense that he was still carrying the loss of his best friend, and it electrified the audience, carried us above the divisiveness of this world, and made us all one, if only for a moment. It was incredible. Dave Grohl is rock and roll saving grace right now. I have so much respect for him. He created a song that's lifted so many to overcome the impossible. I mean, is there any doubt that this song belongs to be number one in our hearts? Not for me. It sounds like these time and time again. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Let us know your memories about Foo Fighters and times like these in this song. What are your thoughts on it? What do you think about Foo Fighters now and then and as a saving grace for rock and roll? Let's have a great discussion below. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe. And until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.